or a software development process called test-driven development. And basically what this process indicates is that the developer, instead of going right ahead and start creating code that would implement some kind of functional requirement, some specific functional requirement, that the developer, what he or she should do first is write a test case in which you will know ahead of time that the case will fail. It's just like, what? So in order to write code, no, let's rephrase it. Before I start writing code, I have to write code that tells me that the code that I'm going to write will fail. You start building your building using those scaffolds. Right? It's sort of like the same kind of principle. So test-driven development. It's a software development process that relies on the repetition of a very short development cycle. And what is that short development cycle? First, the developer writes an initially failing automated test case that defines a desired improvement or new function, then produces the minimum amount of code to pass that test. And then after it has created a whole bunch of minimal amount of code, then it finally refactors the new code to an acceptable standard. Verifying that indeed now the code that has been written will be good enough. So that's pretty much what we're going to try to do now, even though we have created code already. In fact, the reverse engineering process has created code for us. Um, we're going to be doing test cases for our project that will verify that indeed that code that was generated will be good enough. And from here on, before you write code that implements any functional requirement that you want to implement, you have to write the test case that fails it. So enough of theory. Let's do it. This is how you start doing your test cases. Remember, under our libraries, under our web app libraries, there is a jar called the log4j. That's the one that allows us to do logging, right? And the spring, which allows us to do spring, and the hibernate, which allows us to do hibernate. Well, for unit cases, there's also one called JUnit. This jar is a small framework. It's actually a testing framework that will give us the ability to create classes on top of that JUnit jar classes that will allow us to create tests for our project. Now, since we're using Eclipse, Eclipse also has, by default, has wizards sort of like the reverse engineering wizards that we had for Hibernate tools, but it's going to be wizards that would allow us to create unit tests for our project. So where are we going to create our unit tests? Well, we're going to use the same package that we had for our Hibernate test. It's not really a unit test. <clears throat> so that will be com timex auto web test. And what we do is we right click there and we say new. And there's a whole bunch of possibilities like a class, an interface, a package. It's not 
in this list so we're going to indicate other and among the list of Java possibilities there should be one subclass of possibilities called a J unit okay so under Java group of possible new whatever there is a J unit and under J unit you can either create a J unit test case or a J unit test suite right now we're going to start with a simple one which is a test case we click on next and notice that this wizard is almost like the hibernate tools wizard that is going to automatically do reverse engineering this will automatically create code for us we're gonna build a uh, JUnit 3 test class just just because we don't want it to be too um, up-to-date with JUnit uh, version and the reason being is because our JUnit jar included here is a JUnit 3, not a JUnit 4. Okay, so we're going to make sure that this new test case will be compliant with JUnit 3. Okay, it's going to be put under the Timex Auto Web SRC source folder. It's going to be put under this package, com Timex Auto Web test. And we're going to create our simple test. This will be a class. So I expect you to create a capital S simple test class. And the super class, in other words, the class that it will inherit from, will be from the JUnit framework and is going to be called a test case. And we're going to be ask, or we're going to be asking the wizard to create these two methods for us: the setup and the teardown. And we're going to see what they mean and what what their purpose is. Okay, and that's all we're going to do. So we finish, and here it is: automatically create a class called Simple Test that extends from a test case. Oops, I can't see the test case source code. Remember what I did with, with, with Spring and Hibernate when I wanted to see? I will try to get the source code from test case. So I will open declaration or F3. And it will say, sorry, but I cannot show you the source code for test case I don't have it here is the bytecode that I see that it's included in the JUnit jar right but that's all I can give you so what I suggest you do is you go out there source code in Eclipse I'm going to attach the source of that framework and I'm going to indicate that it's an external file and I'm going to tell it where that external file is. That external file is under JUnit 3A2. OK. And here it is. Once again, I can see the source code of my framework. It's very important. Why is it important? because if you have the source code and you understand Java you will be able to get to the inner details of your framework so it's not like a black box or magic you can actually take a look at what's going on this is what a test case looks like Okay, a test case is an abstract class which means some of the methods will have code implemented and some others don't. And the ones that don't have code implemented, you will have to provide it. So an abstract class, imagine it's almost like a half-baked class. Okay? 
Now, our simple test extends from test case. Okay? And what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to implement something in here that would allow us to do a simple test case. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to provide integer variables value 1, value 2, and expected result. Okay? And in the setup, the setup is the method that gets executed right before any test is about to run. In the setup, I am going to initialize value 1 with 2, value 2 with 3, and expected result with a 5. What's going to be my test? But these are the two tests that I'm going to try to create. The first one is called test add success. And yes, when you create a test, it will be a function or method inside your your test class that will start with T E S T. You have to name it test whatever. Okay? Then whatever is up to you. Something meaningful that you will that will tell you exactly uh, what's being tested. Okay? And in this case what I'm about to test is the fact that value 1, which is 2, plus value 2, which is 3, is equal to the expected result, which is 5. How do I test that? I do that through the assert true. Let me give you all the possibilities that there are from the framework that you can assert. Here they are. You can assert that 2 booleans are equal. You can assert that two bytes are equal. You can assert that two characters are equal, etc., etc. There's a whole bunch of assert equals, almost for every single type. What else? There is assert null and assert not null, where it will specify whether the object that you pass as a parameter is null or is not null. Not same or same. So you pass two objects and it will tell you if those two objects are the same. If they are the same, assert same will come up with true. Okay. What about assert true? Assert true, you pass a condition, a boolean condition, and it will tell you whether it's true or not. Okay. These are all the possible tests that you, you can do. Assert equals, assert not null, assert null, assert the same, assert true. Okay? So in this case, we're going to be doing the most common one, which is assert true. And what is it exactly that we're trying to assert? That 2 plus 3 equals 5. Okay? How do you test this? Well, very simple. We are going to test these two, the test add success and the test add fail. Let's let's take a look at the test add fail. What is it saying? I want you to assert that it's false the following that two minus three equals five. We know that two minus three is not five, right? So we're going to assert that it's false. Okay? Let's it's going to ask you what kind of configuration you want to use. And it typically it should be the Eclipse J, J unit launcher. That's the one that you should um, select.
Okay. And notice what happened. It opened a window saying, I just ran simple test and everything is green. You want everything green. Everything green means all your tests passed. What exactly passed? It passed test at success and test at fail. Basically, we just tested the fact that 2 plus 3 equals 5 and that 2 minus 3 is not equal to 5. Now, but typically, typically, you will say, huh, I'm trying to assert that it's true that 2 minus 3 equals 5. And then you try running your test. What's going to happen? You're no longer green. Now you're red. And it will tell you, we ran two out of two tests. And of those two, there was one failure. And it will tell you exactly what the failure is. It will say the failure was in the test add fail. Okay? There was an assertion failed error. So that's when you go and check out and you say, oh, okay, so it is not true that 2 minus 3 equals 5. Now, this is a very simple test, obviously, but we're going to get to do much more complicated tests for our managers, entity managers, and for our controllers, entity controllers. So I'm going to create a brand new test case. This test case, I'm going to call it the department home test. And you guessed it, this guy is going to be testing the department manager. Okay? We're going to we're going to let it create the setup and the teardown. The teardown, by the way, is the function that gets executed after every single test. So the setup gets executed before every single test and the teardown is after every... So basically the setup is the preparation for the test. Sometimes you have to prepare something for the test. And then the teardown is the cleanup after the test. Okay. In this case, we are going to specify a class under test. What's going to be the class under test? It's going to be department home. Here it is. So you select the department home from your project. And then you hit next. As soon as you hit next, notice what it does. It goes and inspects the intrinsics of department home. And all the classes that inherits from. Department home being a pojo right? Plain old Java object. It only inherits from object. But even if it just inherits from object, from object, it has all these class, all these um, functions that come from the object. And we could test them if we wanted to. Now in this case, we're not really want to, uh, interested in testing those object methods. We're interested in more in testing the department home methods. In fact, I want to test the CRUDs. So I want to be able to test the persist, which is a create. I want to test the find by ID, which is a read. I want to test the merge, which is an update. And I want to test the delete, which is a delete. And I'm going to finish. And here it is our department home test, which extends from the test case, which has this setup, this teardown, and it has these test functions. Now, the code automatically generated for us will make sure that all of them fail. So right now, test persist fails. Test delete fails. You want to see it fail? Let's run it. I am going to run this thing as a J unit test. Four out of four, all of them fail. Going to test my department manager find by ID. Okay. 
So I'm going to assert that it's not null, and I can assert not null with a message or without a message. In this case, I'm going to do a message. And the message is going to be department IT exists. Okay? And what's going to be the object? The object's going to be some kind of department. Okay? Now, where is that department coming from? I'm asserting the fact that it's not null that DEPT exists. And DEPT will represent the IT department. Now, you should have very good knowledge of your database at this point. So you have to know exactly what you have. So if I go into my departments, I know that information technology is the fourth department. Okay? If you cannot rely on that, then you have to make sure that your setup creates that record. But that's going to be a little bit more complicated. So right now, for testing find by ID, I'm just going to rely on the fact that I know that there is a department with ID 4 in the database. All right, so let's create it. So we need a department, right? And who's uh, called the EPT? And who's going to give me that department? Well, the, the guy that I, I have to test. Who's that guy? Department home. Right? So I'm going to need a department home. Department home variable. And the setup, I am going to say department home, make a new department home. Got it? So I have a variable that I can use all across my test. My setup will make sure that it will create a new department home from scratch. That's my setup. And then test find by ID will use department home find by ID. And I'm going to find number four. So test find by ID is actually testing the find by ID method of my department home. If I execute this, I know I should get something that is not null. You want to see it? Let's rerun it. Make sure that you understand how to run this window. It's a very simple window. You can rerun the test here, or you can just rerun the test that failed. Okay? You can scroll the log, you can show failures only. I mean, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. So let's rerun the whole thing. Whoa, 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 whoa. What happened? Should be familiar with this one already, right? This is Hibernate loading all the configuration stuff. Cool. Hibernate mappings, etc., etc. Get failed. What? The get in department home failed. Why? Because get is not valid without an active transaction. Darn. You guys remember? We talked about opening a transaction and then committing or rolling back. We have to do that for every single one of the methods. So if we go to the department home, find by ID, line 91, indeed it shows me, hey, look what you're doing. 
you're trying to get the session factor, you're trying to get the current session, right? And then you're trying to get a department by that ID. But there's no transaction associated to it. There's no begin transaction or whatever. So there are two ways of solving this problem. You can either do what we did with timesheet home last week. You guys recall what I did with timesheet home last week, specifically for getting timesheets? What I did was I kept, I broke down the get session, get current session, and saved it as a variable. And then inside the function, I set the begin transaction before I execute any query. And then after I execute the query, I commit the transaction. If I know we run into any hibernate exception or problems, then I roll back the transaction. Those are the changes that I did last week. And you can do the same changes here in Find by ID. You can break down this into a session and then use the begin transaction commit after executing this or roll back if it, there's a runtime exception. Or there's another way. And that way is the one that does not require a begin transaction or a commit. Think about it. If we're just querying the database, we're not really affecting the database. We're just read-only. So there's no sense in having a begin transaction and then a commit of that transaction. So for reads, it does not make sense to do the whole transaction thing. But for create, updates, and deletes, yes. So if you're going to do a create, a read, or I'm sorry, a create, an update, or delete, I suggest you do it this way, the same way that I did it with get timesheets. But if you're going to do it for a read, which is a find by ID, an example, then you don't need to create a new um, a transaction. How do you do that? Very simple. When you get the session factor, instead of asking for get current session, you just open a session. So that session will be open, but not for transaction. Okay? And then you do a get. So you are doing the whole open session and execution of a query all in one statement. Okay? So let's try it again. Let's try it running the unit test. Oops! Still didn't work. Why? A known entity department. That's right. You guys remember we covered this last week. What was wrong with that? Since I'm passing the name of the class, it should be a fully qualified name of the class. If you don't want to fully qualify your classes, then don't pass a string name of the class. Pass the class itself. Oh, But how do I do that? Very simple. Let's see what are our options. Get. You get. You can get with the entity name, which in this case it will be a string that you have to fully qualify the class, or the actual class. So let's do this one. So what class am I going to pass? Well, the department class. Got it? So let's see if now this works. Where's my test? 
Here's my test. J unit, rerun. Yes! It passed. Test find by ID passed. Now, don't confirm yourself with just doing an assert not null. Come on, guys, you have the department right there with you. What else do you want to test? Well, let's see what we can test in the department. How about if we test the fact that the ID is equal to 4? Right? Makes sense. So let's assert that. Let's assert that department get ID is equal to 4. Assert equals. Oh, and it should be object object is ambiguous for the type department home test. Let me see, get ID is what? An integer. And this is an integer. Oh, okay. Maybe I have to create a new integer with the value 4. Yep, that's what it was. You remember, it's comparing two objects, right? So we are going to assert the fact that this is equal. The department get ID is 4 and the new integer is 4. What do you guys think? Is that going to pass? Let's run it. Yes. So now we have two tests, very small tests, under test find by ID. We're first of all testing the fact that there is something called an IT department and that its ID is equal to 4. Okay? And that's all part of the find by ID. Now, let's do a test delete. This is a little bit more tricky. What would you do for a test delete? I mean, you obviously don't want to mess up your four departments, right? So you're going to have to create one department and then delete it and then test the fact that it was deleted. So instead of doing that, let's test the persist first. Okay? So how would you do the persist? Uh, now, let's test the persist for the department. What is it that we're trying to test? The fact that a department can be created in the database, right? How do you assert that? Right now it's failing. Say not yet implemented. It's failing. What do we assert? I want to assert that it's not null means exists a department. In fact, I'm going to be doing something similar to this. I want a message. I want to assert that new department exists. Okay? Now, to do that, I have to be able to tell the department home to persist a department. Okay? And this is going to be a new department.
a new department. So what are you going to do when the test persists? You're going to create a brand new department, then you're going to tell the department home to persist it, and then you're going to assert that it's not that it's not empty. That it's not null. What do you guys think? Is that is that correct? You think that you are actually testing the te the, the persist? Not really. You're creating a new department here, right? Then you're telling the department manager to persist it. And then you're just asserting that that department is not null. Of course it's not null. You just created one. What you have to do is you have to actually go and look for it. Tell the department manager to go and look for it after he has persisted it. After it has persisted it, you have to tell the department home to go and find it. But it's not going to be finded by ID. What do you think it's going to be finded by? By example. Because we have the example right here. We just created it. Now, do you want it to be uh, an empty department? Wouldn't make much sense, would it? Okay, how about if we create a new department? This way. Actually passing the name, the state, and the timesheets associated to it. Sounds a little bit complicated, doesn't it? What's going to be the name? Accounting. I think we have accounting. Accounting we have. We're just going to call it new department. Or we can call it test department. What's going to be the state? PA. What's going to be the timesheets? No timesheets. All right, so we have just created a new department from Pennsylvania with no timesheets, locally. Then we're going to tell the department manager to persist it. Then we're going to tell the department manager to find that department. If it finds it, that means the persisted worked. So, do we really want to assert non-null department? No, we don't. What is it we want to assert that it's non-null? The fact that finding by example that department exists. That's what we want to assert non-null. Got it? It's not the department that we want to assert that is not null. We, we have created it here. We know it exists. It's not null. It's the fact that we want to assert that it exists in the database. In other words, that the department manager will be able to find that by example. Got it? Let's run it. In fact, we can just rerun it. Ba -ba -ba. Whoa. What happened? Same thing without active transaction. So I know you guys are going to be running to this issue over and over again. So in this case, the persist. The persist, you're actually creating a department. So you want a transaction. You want to play it safe. You want to be able to open a transaction and all, do all that stuff. How do we do it in Timesheet Home? Very simple. This is how we do it. We create a session. 
So in the persist, we create the session. We set get session factory, get current session, and we put it here. And then we say begin transaction. Okay. Then we execute the persist, but out of the session that we just created. So you get rid of this part. Right? If it's successful, then you want to commit. So right after it persists, if it persisted OK, you want to commit. If it didn't, somehow there's a hibernate exception, then you want to roll back. And those are the minor modifications that you have to do on your on your managers, obviously. All right? You want to try it again? Let's run it. Ooh, we are running into problems. Let me project clean. Project clean. Yep, that one. I didn't like session. Oh, that's right. You notice that if I declare session inside the try, as soon as I exit the try, that session is no longer available. So I have to change it. I think what I did here was I created session outside the try. Right? So I'll have to do something similar. Create session outside the try. All right. OK, let's run it again. Pop, 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 pop. What's up? Oops. Oh, find by example. Find find the example. <laughs> We're calling. See what happened here? Our test is calling persist. Right? Hey, what happened here? Our test is calling persist. We took care of that, but it's also calling find by example. So we have to fix find by example. <laughs> right? We have to fix this one too. Now, find find example is what? It's a read, right? So I can take care of that. By doing what? Something similar to the find by ID, which is open session instead of get current session. Right? And create criteria. Let's see if create criteria needs a fully qualified. What is it? Create criteria. See this? Create criteria also allows you to pass a class name. So that's what we're going to do. Let's pass the class. So we don't have to fully qualify it.
Got it? Okay, let's rerun our tests. See how you're little by little by running your test, you're actually fixing your code? All right, what happened now? Test persist, passed. Test find by ID, passed. So there's only two failures now. Out of the four, there's only two failures. Test delete, and test merge. So you keep building it. So now you do the test delete. How, do you, how can you test the test delete? Yeah, you have to create one, right? So you have to persist one, and then you delete it, and then you go ahead and try to find it, and you should get nothing. Unless you want to delete one of these, which I don't recommend. Right? I will refresh the database. That's a very good, very good question that you used. It. Look at this new department, new department. What happened there? We run this two times. In fact, if I run it a third time, there's going to be a third. <coughs> We have to do a cleanup. We have to do a cleanup. You guys see this? So, how about How about if we just do the following? All this setup for testing we, or preparation for testing, we just run it under setup. And all the teardown, which is getting rid of or clean up, do it on the teardown. So the creation of this new department will be put here under the setup. Now I have to make it available to everybody, right? So I'm just going to declare it up here. So now it's available here. So the setup would actually create a manager of the department and it will create, even if we need it or not, it's going to create a new department and it's going to persist it. Now to make sure that we have our database clean after any test, what do we have to do? delete that department. So what's going to be our test for delete? Anybody? Okay, let's let's run it at its current state. Okay? So so far we have these new departments which are not good. So I'm going to have to get rid of them. So let me edit. And let's delete these. Okay? Apply changes. They're gone. So we're back to square one. And in fact, I suggest that so you don't mess up your database and you create a a backup of it before you start doing all these changes. Okay? So now let's run these tests. We 
Whoa. Delete is not valid without an active transaction. So delete has the same problem. Guys, see that? But now we know. Delete is going to be very similar to what? To persist. Now let's try it again. Run the tests. Cool. Still. Assertion failed. What happened? Oh. Did we keep that fail assertion? Of course we did. <laughs> Not good. But if we go to our database, no new departments. Which means for every single one of the tests, whether they failed or not, it was able to set it up and tear it down. So what's going to be the test for our test delete? Well, we have to tell the department home to delete it, right? And then, what do we have to do? How do we know that it's not going to be in the database, that this delete happened? Hello? Yes. No. Find it. Let's try finding it. Let's see if we can find it. Okay, so it came back. What are we going to assert? Assert what? If it worked, it should be null. Right? So we're going to assert the fact that this is null. If our delete work, finding it should be null. Let's run it. Delete fail. Where did delete fail? It all started here, Department Home seventy eight. You guys see what's going on? We still have the same four departments. Why is it failing? Test delete is failing. Actually, it's not failing. It's an error. I'm glad we came across this. What's the difference between an error and a failing? You guys know? A failure means one of your asserts did not come what you expected. One of your asserts did not result in what you expected. That's a failure. An error means you got a runtime error. Something is wrong with your tests. And that's what we have right now. Batch update return unexpected row count for update zero, actual row count zero, and expected is one. If you guys see, the setup is created now for our new department. Our test delete is getting rid of it. And then it's asserting that it 
that it's not there. But then when it tries to do the teardown, it's trying to delete it, and it's not there anymore. <laughs> you guys see that? So you have to somehow create it again. You want to try it again? <whistles> Delete fail. Which one? This delete fail. The tear down. The J unit test. You can also debug the J unit test. So what I suggest you do is before you debug it, I suggest that you show view outline. I suggest that you take each one of them, the setup, the teardown, the persist, the delete, the merge, and the find by ID and create breakpoints for it. So you toggle method breakpoint. So each one of them notice that has a breakpoint. It will stop in any one of them. And now, instead of running it as a JUnit, you are going to debug it as a JUnit. And when you do that, obviously it's going to ask you what launcher you want. Eclipse JUnit launcher, of course. When you execute it, it should switch to the debug There it is. It should switch to the debug perspective. If it's the first time that you're doing it, it was going to ask you, hey, I should switch to the debug perspective. Do you want to memorize this? Just say yes. Memorize it. And from now on, don't ask me. Just go to the debug perspective. Here it is. We're about to execute the department home test setup. All right. Let's go over it creates a new department, here it is, and it persists it. Look all the stuff that it does just to persist the one. Now you want to see it? Go to your database, refresh, here it is. New department. Let's continue. Now we continue. Now it's about to test the persist. So it's not a certain unknown that this, we're just going to skip over because we know it will pass that test. Now it's about to do the teardown. Let me see the teardown. It should delete the department. Did it delete the department? Let's refresh. Yes, it deleted the department. Okay, let's continue. Now it's about to do the setup for the next test. We know that it runs this. The delete. This is the one that is failing. Let's see why it's failing. Okay. Let's tell it to delete the department. It deleted it. Now let's ta tell it to assert null that it doesn't exist. Whoa, that's where it's failing. It's going to return results, right? So now it's going to try to assert that it's null, the list, and it's not true. The list is not null. 
So we're failing right there. Okay, so for the test delete, a certain all is not a good example. What we should do is what? What should we do? What is find by example getting back to us? Find by example is getting us a list, right? You want to make sure that a list, like any list, it has a what? Has a what? A size. What you want to assert is that that size is equal to an integer. Zero. So instead of assert null, it's not true. It's assert equals. Is it equal or equals? Equal. No. Assert equals these two things. Expected and actual. Assert equals. It's object, object. So size size is an int. So I have to create a new integer of that size. Remember, you are comparing objects. So you're telling it, hey, department manager, find by example the department. Since we deleted it, it should not find it. So it's going to come up with a list of size 0. We're going to ask what size that is and we're going to create a new integer with it. And we're going to assert that it's equal to 0. Got it? Let's run it as a unit test. Shoot. Oh, wait a minute. Duh! <laughs> Remember, we're trying to delete the same department here. Gosh. What we have to do is we have to create a new department. Persist it. And then let the teardown take care of that new department. Let's see. So, see that? Now we're up to 38. <laughs> So let's um, edit, let's delete it, okay, so we're going to make sure, yep, yep, we only have those four, and then we're going to try to run it. Whew. Passed. Now, let's take a look. Test delete pass. Test persist pass. Test find by ID pass. The only one that is pending is test merge. Now, test merge, what you would do is you would actually change the name of the department to old department. And then test the fact that you that it changed. Right? So you will have to go and ask the department manager to um, find that department with the new name. And if it finds it, then you know that it's being called a different name. But you understand why the delete was having problems here? You guys understand that? It's very important that you understand what was wrong with the with the um with the test here. In the test delete we actually did the setup, right? What does the setup do? It created a department. And suppose that this new department has ID 35. And it was persisted. And when it was persisted, it was given ID 35. In here, we say, get rid of that department. 
and then we assert that it's equal to when we try find it by example that what we get is zero doesn't exist so the new department with ID 35 does not exist anymore this worked but now before we actually do the teardown we have to replace that department otherwise it's going to try to delete again uh, another department with ID 35 and that's not going to work so what we do is we do a cleanup and what's the cleanup we create a new department notice that we're not specifying what ID is at this point just a new department and then we tell it to persist now in this case it persisted to 36 because we it's an auto increment see that so this guy now became another new department with ID 36 and that's the one that it gets teared down here the 36 and not the 35 if we try deleting the 35 then we're going to get again into the, the, the that exception okay the question is why do I have project home and project manager you don't need project home and project manager what you should have is timesheet home or timesheet manager yeah the reverse engineer gave me what timesheet home last year I created from scratch timesheet manager so if you created it if you created your entity from scratch most probably your entity will be called timesheet manager your entity manager will be called en timesheet manager but if you created it with the reverse engineer then it will be called it will be called timesheet home you don't need both you only need one 